Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me on my late night thoughts with Guide Dogs SG and Sophie. And I will just be inviting Guide Dogs SG and dear Sophie to join us on this IG Live. And I just want to briefly introduce what this IG Live is about. Thank you everyone who is joining in right now. I'm just giving a brief introduction about this IG Live. So as some of you may know, I've started my own brand called Late Night Thoughts Club, and I thought it was perfect to partner up with Guide Dogs Singapore because I first met them earlier this year during, during International Guide Dogs Day. And I thought it was so amazing what they were doing for the visual uh, impairment community uh, in Singapore and I wanted to know how I can get involved with raising awareness for guide dogs and guide dogs Singapore and also the visually impaired. So uh, I wanted to arrange this so that all of you could also find out more about guide dogs Singapore and learn all the amazing things that they're doing. For Late Night Thoughts Club, my brand, um, we will be donating 10% of proceeds to Guide Dogs Singapore. Um, and also all of my uh, following up, um, how should I say this, my following collections, because this is my first collection, will also be partnering with the charity. So I hope to be doing more meaningful work with Guide Dogs Singapore. Now, let me just see where Sophie is. Yay, she sent me an invitation. So let me just accept her. Okay, I think it's loading. One second. Hello. Hello, Sophie. Hello. Thank you for Hi. joining us today. So excited to be here. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Hello, hello. So Sophie is very special. She is uh, a Paralympic swimmer and she represented Singapore uh, during the Tokyo Paralympics. Am I yes. right? That's right. That's exactly right. And she's also a part of the visually impaired community in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, you give a brief introduction of um, yourself and uh, just for, you know, all the, the viewers here to get to know you a bit better. Of course. Okay, so hi, everybody. My name is Sophie, and I am part of the visually, pet, uh, visually impaired community, as Fiona was saying. So um, if you hear some crunching noises next to me, my guide dog, Orinda, is actually chewing on her bone right now. I'll give you a little video of her oh later. Oh my god, so cute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's chewing on her I'll do my introduction, and she'll say hi. But, um, yeah, so my condition is known as um, Conrad dystrophy. Um, it's a very scientific term, but basically what it means for my vision is that I actually see much poorer in the day than I do at night. So um, I have very good um, night vision, but extremely poor day vision. Um, I also cannot see color. I've lost my color vision at a very young age. Um, however, because I did have color vision, um, up till I was about, say, eight or nine. That's when we um, kind of pinpointed where I lost most of my color vision. Um, I still have, in a way, rough concepts of color. So even though I may not see in color, my brain, in a way, it tries to autofill in that sense. So for example, if I were to see a tree, I would know that the trunk is brown. I would know the leaves are green based on um, previous memory. But if you were to give me an item of clothing and ask me what color it is, because that's quite a random item in that sense, it could be any color. And that's where it starts to go a bit haywire. I really, I really cannot tell most of the time. So how I actually coordinate my clothing is based on memory. So I would know, oh, this clothing is what piece of color and like it would match with what kind of clothing. So I wouldn't look, go out looking like a very um, uncoordinated duck or <laughs> it looks very strange. Yeah, I try to. You know, try and make it as coordinated as possible. Um, yeah, so I see a lot better at night. Yep, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. I just want to ask, when did this start sure. um, happening? When did you start realizing that you had this? Okay, so um, it was noticed quite early on when I was about 
Um, actually, since I was even a baby, my parents said that I wouldn't really react to things until it was brought much closer to me. But they say the pivotal moment for them was um, there was this one time I was in a car with my dad and my mom went out to run an errand and she was coming back and she was in very visible distance. And my dad um, tried to point out like, hey, mom, mommy is there. But I somehow couldn't see her and I just kept saying, where, where, where is she? I can't see. And it was only until she was much closer to the car when I started reacting like, oh, mommy is back. And I think that's when it was that moment for them to go, mm, I think something's not right. And they brought me to the eye doctor. And I think around age five was when I went to the eye doctor for the first time. And they were like, yeah, she definitely has some sort of visual condition, but we can't pinpoint what yet, depending on the nature of the progression. And it was only until about I was about seven that I was diagnosed with cone rod dystrophy. So yeah, and pretty much been, yeah, been labeled with that since. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that's, that's the condition that I have, yes. But you're so inspiring. I mean, there are some <laughs> viewers, viewers right now. Hello to everyone who's tuned in. Thank you for Hi. joining me, <laughs> Sophie, and Guide Dog Singapore. Um, many people are saying that um, how inspiring you are. Thank you. And Thanks, everyone. It's amazing that you did not let mm-hmm. this condition um, limit you or stop you. And um, how did you, uh, what was your journey like leading up to the Paralympics? Uh, and oh. representing Singapore for swimming in the Paralympics. In a single word, it was exhausting. <laughs> it was so tiring. Oh, like, really. we will be training, like, each week, I would train about 11 times a week. So each day can consist of at least maybe about two to three trainings within a single day. So um, I'll have eight swim sessions and three gym sessions. And that doesn't even count the um, massage sessions that we have weekly, um, the physiotherapy sessions, biomechanics sessions, um, psychology, um, meeting up the psychologists, um, talking to nutritionists, dietitians. So all these things um, was ramping up so much and it was really, really exhausting, honestly, going into it. But I would trade it for nothing because it's given me an experience that money can never buy. It's such an amazing experience to not only be amongst the world's best, but just to be there, you know, to, to be there to represent your country at the world's highest stage of competition. And it was just such an b- amazing experience that I really, I don't know how to explain. Like, it was just so great. And I think what made it even better is the company that was with you because you know that everyone there was striving so hard for so many years to um, fight for a slot to get to Tokyo. And everyone there has truly earned their space to get to compete for the country and it's such a honor to be there to say the least <laughs> yeah I'm sure that everyone here is yeah. so proud of you and thank so you that you could represent singapore in the paralympics that's so amazing like Thanks. that's something that you know most people can only dream of but you actually went and did it oh yeah like, oh amazing. yeah <laughs> start training like did you were you training many mm-hmm. many years up until the paralympics So I started my competitive swim journey actually at age 15, which is extremely late because most people actually retire when they're 15 because they'll start preparing for their O-levels or N-levels. And that's when um, school starts ramping up so it gets a bit busier. But I started at 15 where most people start at 8 or 7. And um, I joined the national team when I was 18 when the ASEAN Para Games came to Singapore together with the SEA Games in 2015. So that's well, that was my debut and my um, starting stage, I would say, to the national team. And I guess that's where it started to fuel my fire to go, hey, I think I really want to try and compete for the Tokyo Paralympics. Uh, sorry, for, actually for the Paralympics, because at that time, we had a month to qualify for Rio Paralympics. And just being in the team for, like, I think it was only six months at that point, I was so determined to qualify for Rio Paralympics. And unfortunately, I didn't make it. And um, I never felt so much disappointment in my life. Um, I think most people and my friends, they'll know me as a very laid back person who doesn't really strive for many <laughs> things in life. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, it was just something about that. Like, oh man, like I, I didn't make it and I just felt so gutted and disappointed. And I remember in 2016 making it my mission and my goals. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't even say do or die. It was just a do or do. I have to make it to, 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 the, to the Tokyo Paralympics. And wow. thankfully, I managed to make that happen. <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Thank like, you. Unreal. So proud of you. <laughs> Thank you and, so much. Yeah. And so I saw on your Instagram uh, that mm-hmm. you also brought Orinda, your guide mm-hmm. dog, yes. with you 
with Tokyo, right? For the Tokyo Paralympics? I did not, but maybe this is time oh, for, no. for a quick experience because uh, for a quick exposure because she's actually facing me right now. So, okay. hi everyone, this is Orinda. <laughs> oh my god, it's, she's so cute! <laughs> so hi, she's... Orinda. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> so yes, she's on her bed currently oh, she's enjoying sweet. life. Yes. Oh, then maybe the photo I saw was training. Sorry. I um, got... probably it was training. Yes. So That's she did bad. not make it with me to Paralympics, and for many reasons. And actually, I did see a few guide dogs when I was at the Tokyo Paralympic oh, Village. Really? So that made me ache for her because I never miss her so much. I was like, oh man, there are people with their guide dogs here, but um, I did leave her home for good reason because um. The reason I have Orinda is for independent travel. So when I'm in Singapore, I go about training by myself. I go to work on my own. So, um, you know, it's definitely have, having her makes it so much more easy, easier to travel about on my own versus traveling around with a cane. But when I'm traveling, especially when I go to Tokyo, most of the time I'm with a coach or I'm with my teammates and everyone there is looking out for each other. So in that sense, she would be rather redundant if I brought her to Tokyo. And on top of that, I'll still have to um, feed her. I'll still have to give her her walks instead of, you know, fully focusing on the competition. I will also have to think about her as well. So um, for, you know, to, I think it's for herself and myself, I decided to leave her home, but she was very well taken care of by my parents and, also some other um, borders that volunteer borders with Guide Dog Singapore that offer to take the dogs into their own homes just to help watch over the dogs in case um, the handlers such as myself are unable to watch them for a certain period of time. So okay. she had a whole That's army good. watching her, or her That's whole village watching over her. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe another time, another trip. But oh yeah, I'm for sure. I'm glad to hear that, you know, it wasn't too difficult for you mm-hmm. without Orinda. Oh, um, no, I was fine. <laughs> yeah. And I, I heard that uh, you and Orinda are mm-hmm. Guide Dog Singapore's seventh team, right? Yes. Is that the seventh pairing of a Guide we, Dog pair? Yes, ever? we are. Not so very many how, of us. How is, that, how is, how is like the, <laughs> the visually impaired community and like the Guide Dog community in Singapore? Um, mm-hmm. How did you first meet them? How did you first, uh, you know, I don't know, come in contact with them? Okay, so um, well, just that was, that was a few questions, but I'll oh, just sorry. yeah, no worries, it's all right, <laughs> it's okay, no worries. But um, the visually impaired community in Singapore and generally around the world is extremely small. I don't think there's any specific percentage or numbers that we can work with currently, but especially with, currently in Singapore with an aging population, generally we are somewhat growing. So it is always important to look out for the visually impaired community and to get yourself educated about it because you just don't know who around you and any loved ones around you that may eventually experience vision loss. So I think it's a, you know, a great um, time to get educated about um, this community. It's not yeah. very vocal. and I won't say it's not vocal, but it's, um, it's not something that's talked about as frequently as I feel it should. So yeah. hopefully with this experience with, your platform and with you um, doing so many wonderful things like i know it's just a start but it's so exciting to have this wonderful partnership with yourself and hopefully even more uh, other people that can get on board can have more Mm -hmm. open discussions about the visually impaired community in terms of um, the guide dog community in singapore it is extremely small i'm pretty sure it's in single digit right now so (laughs) we are currently um i think we only have about um five working teams with a registered under guide dog singapore if i'm remember yeah. correctly because two recently have retired and mm-hmm. um yeah so we're not a very big number it's very difficult to come across um someone with a guide dog but yeah and you yeah. can see the excitement in the public when you when i whenever i walk around like, oh my gosh it's a guide dog because they only hear about uh-huh. it in school or you know they yeah. see about advertisements in the mrt stations yeah. or bus stations but it's very rare that you actually get to see one so um yeah we are quite a rare unicorn breed i would say that's <laughs> um, why i want help to raise more awareness, you know, about Mm -hmm. the visually impaired community and guide dogs and guide dogs because I find that uh, we need to, we need to have more awareness about it. You know, we we might heard about it or we might, you know, find out about it or maybe even from like the media, but it's very rare in our daily lives that we might come across such a situation. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and why do you think is the reason Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's not more guide dog uh, mm-hmm. teams in Singapore like mm-hmm. is it is it the cost of, of mm-hmm. training a guide dog 
or, mm-hmm. or what, why do you think? Well, there's actually many different reasons and I would say the vast majority of it is very personal because firstly, you're committing to a dog for the next six to eight years of your life. And some mm-hmm. people may not feel that, oh, I'm ready or I'm capable to do that. And mm-hmm. on top of that also, there's financial costs. You also have to take care of a dog. Like, this is a 24-7 job. Like, when you, when you walk around with a cane, when you leave the cane, when you go back home, you just put it at one corner and that's it. <laughs> you don't have to do anything else. But with a guide dog, once the harness is off, it's a dog. You have to take care yeah. of it. There's feeding to do. If she or he is sick, you have to take them to the vet. There is toileting to do. You have to keep up its training. You have to keep up its exercise. There's a lot of things that, that come into play that a lot of people do not, um, that, that they need to take into consideration before um, applying and getting a guide dog. But, you know, I don't think this is, this is a reason that, you know, just because we are small in numbers, we shouldn't be educating people because a big, big problem that we have with guide dogs and, and actually another reason that quite a few people consider not getting guide dogs is accessibility issues. And it's not because of the law, because the law is firmly in place for guide dogs to um, enter malls, to enter restaurants, even Hala restaurants, Moose is extremely supportive of guide dogs. But it's unfortunate that the ground staff are unaware of this and that causes mm. a lot of trouble for us, including myself. And it becomes like, in a way, some sort of anxiety. Every time I leave the house and I'm about to go to a restaurant, I'm ready to, you know, put up a fight and face rejection because that is just how often it happens. It's very, very frequent. And I think this is something that needs to be talked about more and advocated more that accessibility for guide dog users such that, you know, even though we may be small in numbers, we will grow. And, you know, we wouldn't want this to be a factor for current, you know, um, guide dog applicants who maybe considering or on the fence, we wouldn't want this to be a factor for them to think about accessibility because accessibility is not a privilege. It is not like an entitlement. It's something that should everyone should be getting equally. So oh I just God. hope this is something that we can you know, talk about more. Yeah. <laughs> Preach, girl. Preach. <laughs> that is so true. I 100% wholeheartedly agree with you. And I, I, that's why I want to open up the conversation. And I hope, you know, those of you viewing... Hello, thank you for joining us again for our IG Live, like, you know, spreading the word, you know, being more open minded about it. If you, you know, know of people who are not sure about whether guide dogs are even allowed in Singapore, I mean, legally, it is definitely allowed even in grabs, right? Even in, in public transport, in, in mm-hmm. private hire, uh, grabs, uh, in, in, like you said, restaurants, mm-hmm. halal restaurants. So mm-hmm. I find that, you know, out of all the the obstacles that one might face um, mm-hmm. in, in the community, welcoming and like acceptance should not be one of the problems I find. So of course, I yes. really hope that in the coming years, I will be able mm-hmm. to see more guide dog uh, pairs in Singapore. Of course. Yes. Um, yes. And a little bit about uh, guide dogs since we're on the topic. Um, mm-hmm. What are the, the guide dog breeds and like how mm-hmm. long is the training for uh, one guide dog? Sure. So in Singapore, usually most of our guide dogs are golden Labrador mix. Um, mm-hmm. However, overseas, you get a mixture of breeds. One, the, the one breed that I particularly love is the German Shepherd. However, we don't have one in Singapore yet, but hopefully one day. Oh, um, yeah, they are adorable. Mm-hmm. But um, yes, yeah, so training for a guide dog, um, I would say it's pretty much the whole of its youth is taken up for its training. So mm-hmm. um, at five weeks, they're actually given an assessment called the puppy, the puppy Profiling Assessment, where mm-hmm. they are put through a series of tests to see if they, are, um, they have the right personality to potentially become a guide dog. And if they pass that test, they will move on to um, the puppy raising program. So they'll be put into homes with volunteer puppy parents where these parents will raise them and not only raise them and do basic obedience with them, but they will also take them out into places where they will eventually start their work when once they start into training and eventually graduate and become guide dogs. So they will have to take them on buses, on trains. They have to take them into supermarkets. They have to take them to work. All these places that a normal dog would not go because they have to get used to the stimulants and um, all the noises and sounds and um, busyness that you know a normal dog would not face, and yeah. this is not something that they have to be, they can be afraid of because this is something that they have to face on a daily basis. So yeah. once that is done, they will go through that for about a year, 
And then for the next six months, that's when they actually start their guide dog training with the guide dog school. So they'll be brought back into the, the guide dog school facility and they will start their training for the next six months to sometimes even a year. And during this time is when they'll start being matched with the clients within the guide dog school. So they'll, according to the um, profile of the dog and the profile of the client, you'll see which one matches best and that's how they'll do the matching process. I so see. it's pretty, quite a lot to consider actually. <laughs> I was people doing mine. Yeah. yeah, people don't realize, I think, the amount of uh, like resources and um, time and, and energy is needed to, to train a guide dog and like the whole process from even selecting the right breed, right? It from, is, from it is. The right all... breed, the right parents, yeah. the right uh, parent pairing. Right. There's so much going on. Right. Exactly, exactly. And then um, also with the cost, right? We did speak mm -hmm. of like, how much is it to train one guide dog? Oh my, this, I think it, it oh my goodness. I heard the average for a guide dog is about $50,000. So that is incredibly expensive and something that, I don't think I'll be able to afford on my own. So thankfully, through the generous donations that we receive, um, yeah. you know, into guide dogs that we are able to, you know, they're able to bring in dogs for the clients free of charge. So um, I'm so grateful for that because, you know, it gives everybody the opportunity regardless of what, um, you know, income background you're from, you are able to receive a guide dog if you are willing and able to take care of the dog for the rest of its yeah. life. So yeah, I think it's great that we are given, giving everyone equal opportunity in that sense. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's why if everyone, anyone who is watching who, you know, is able to donate, uh, the, the donations that you give to uh, Guide Dog Singapore is, uh, you know, going into helping uh, the Guide Dog training program and um, also other, other kind of campaigns and programs for the visually impaired, right? And so I think this is why um, I, I find joy in, in sharing and spreading awareness about Guide Dog Singapore because I find that they're changing lives, you know, and yes. I, for me personally, um, I, I don't know how to say this to not uh be too soppy but a part of no, me i just say it what, like what would happen if you know it, it could be any of us right like mm -hmm. so what if it was like me and, and and i would also need uh something like you know a guide dog or some sort of mm -hmm. training or some sort of like program to to help me i find that um we all need to be more empathetic for people uh, because exactly. you never know you never know we're all struggling with our our own you know issues and i find that um mm -hmm. We yeah, basically I I find that it helping helping one community right it will help us all in the future. So that's of why course yeah, we'll like be more you, like giving and also more accepting of um, you know guide dogs and guide dog Singapore. Yeah, exactly. Like we were actually just saying earlier, like you just don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Like I mean, uh, knock on wood. Of course, we want the best for ourselves, but you really don't know what's gonna happen to yourself. You don't know what's gonna happen to loved ones in the future. And mm -hmm. even in the position of my parents, they would have never guessed that they would have a visually impaired child. <laughs> so yeah. it's not something that, you know, you, you ever wish upon someone, but you don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, the more education you can get about whatever community, the better. Because once you're put, or anyone that you know is put in it, you know how to help. It's easier. Because when yeah. my parents first found out about me and my condition, they were frantic. They didn't know what to do. They, they mm. were at a loss because it never occurred to them that, you know, one day they are going to be in somewhat involved in the visually impaired community. And they did know of people who were blind or visually impaired, but it never occurred to them to, de to get themselves educated about it. So yeah. I think regardless of, you know, whether you may, you may know nobody now with any visual impaired uh, condition, I think it's good regardless to get educated. And of course, you know, you can help out people, you know, if you see someone who is um, blind, visually impaired, you know, in your community and you want to help them, you will have the confidence to go out and help them because you know what to do and you don't have to be so afraid because a lot of times we don't receive help because everyone is so scared of us. <laughs> For some reason, they're like, mm. oh, I don't know what to do with someone who's visually impaired and they immediately back off. And I can't do, I do have some residual vision. So sometimes when I'm in the mall and I can see people really freaked out and they don't know what to do when they see mm. me either with a cane or with Orinda, they mm. really don't know what to do and they start, and their first reaction is to back off. 
And if I were in, in need of help, that would be very difficult because no one is going to help me. So I, that, I think I it's, want yeah. that to be the question that I ask you, which is that mm-hmm. how can we uh, be better allies and be supporters mm-hmm. and like, how can we help in a situation if we really do come across someone visually impaired, either with a cane or with a guide mm-hmm. dog in, in public? Like, how do we yeah. do it in a way that is, um, mm-hmm. that you would like and, and like us to do? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think that, that's a great question. So um, what I would really like is usually um, when someone comes up to me, they um, come up to me with um, my gender pronouns. So like, hi, miss, or hi, madam. Um, I'm a little young for madam, but <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so um, hi, sir. Hi, miss. Hi, ma'am. Um, yeah. Can I help you? And the reason why I feel this is important because there's a lot of times people are talking around us and not to us. So if you just go, hi, do you need help? Sometimes we think that you're talking to someone else that just happens to be around us and we'll just ignore you. And people can get offended and they'll think that's rude of us. But really, we just don't know that you're talking to us. So it's good to go like, hi, sir. Hi, ma'am. Um, do you need help? And if they say no, then that's great. Marry on your way. Just say, all right, great. And yeah. let them be. I think it's also good to be able to accept a no because... You know, if they really are fine, then just let them be fine on their own. It's okay. But if they go, yes, I do need help. And if you want to actually offer them directions, the best thing that you could do is actually take them to where they are looking for, especially if you know where it is. And how would you take them is you can offer them their arm. If they were using a cane, you would say, oh, would you like to take my arm? So that's where um, the visually impaired or blind person will hold on to your elbow and you would give them sighted guides. So you'll be walking one, um, in a way, half an arm's length in front of them. And the reason we wouldn't want to put the visually impaired or blind person in front of you and push like how most people would die is if because if there was an obstacle in front and you don't see it in time, you're putting the blind person at risk. So if, say, there was a step, and you didn't see it, you're pushing the blind person and the, blind, and the visually impaired or blind person would fall off that step and you'll Terrible. be just left there dangling. Yes, it's, it's very unsafe. Oh, so no. it's better that you as the sighted person take the lead and the blind person or visually impaired person follows by holding your arm from behind. So that then you take them to the place and then you can ask them, is there anything I can help you with? And they're no, then that's all right. Then that's great. Um, mm-hmm. Personally, for myself with a guide dog, the best way to is, um, of course, if I need help uh, with directions, the person take me there. But, okay, you can offer sighted guide as well. But another option is the follow command. So basically, you would walk ahead of me, probably about um, maybe like a one, one uh, I'll say two feet in front of me. Mm-hmm. And Orinda is actually trained to follow. So if you just give yourself, the person in front just gives like two taps on the on. Um, near their bum or like the side of their leg actually is great the side of the leg and just give two taps every now and then Orinda is trained to follow that so I would just say okay Orinda follow and she will just follow so, along with whoever is there okay so the person yep. leading so if I'm helping mm-hmm. am mm-hmm. I the one the two taps or are you giving yes. the two yes you're the one that gives two taps and then I would just say Orinda follow and she will follow you oh pretty cool it, isn't it <laughs> wow I never knew that because I think me and I think a few um, a few viewers here as well mm-hmm. um, are were taught that we should never um, touch a guide dog if they are in um, on duty. Yes, like if they're, if they're outdoors and w- with their handler. Yes. So that means that we mm-hmm. should not like mm-hmm. approach them and pet them, you know, in a way that some yes. people do with dogs, unless yes. we're in a situation where we are helping mm-hmm. to guide. Yes. Then yep. and it's okay to kind of like pat them once in a while to let them know that they're it's following. It's not so petting them, it's petting your leg. So you would pet your own leg oh, and make this sound oh. like a, this sound I so see. that they would know, oh, there's a sound to follow. So then they'll follow that sound. Okay. It's not petting their leg, it's petting okay. your own leg. So you just like give a, a tap tap. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries, okay. it's okay. That, yeah. It's like the sound and the motion to, to of yeah. like follow. I can, exactly. That, that's good I mean, her. If you ever forget, the best advice I can give you is just ask. That's the best, yeah. the simplest thing. You can ask the person because what I may pre- be what, what I may prefer may be different from what other visually impaired or blind people may prefer. So the best way you can do is just go up to them and say, 
how can I help you? And they would best tell you, oh, can I hold on to your arm? Can you walk in front of me? My guide dog will follow you. Can you stand on my right? They will, they will tell you how they want to be helped. So the best thing you can do is just ask and really don't be afraid to ask. Okay, good to yeah. know. Very useful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and how, how has your life been um, since you were paired with Orinda, your guide dog, last year? Um, oh my God. Yes. What are the major changes that you found in your life from before mm-hmm. to, to now? So many changes. I mean, firstly, I low-key feel like a mom because I'm taking <laughs> care of her like 24-7. <laughs> and I, sometimes she gets up in the middle of the night and I get worried. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really a mom. <laughs> but oh. in terms of, you know, mobility and accessibility, I feel so much more free because... When I was using a cane, I was completely relying on myself to get from point A to point B. And not only that, but I say the biggest difference is that a cane just detects obstacles for you. So if, for example, if there was a bin in my way, it would just tell me, oh yeah, there's a bin, but it doesn't help me get around it. When I have Arinda with me, she's more like, oh, there's a bin. Let me find a way to get around it. So I don't even have to think about how do I get around this bin. She does it for me. So I'll just have to tell her, find a way. And she will find a way around the bin. And we're off on our merry way. Sometimes I don't even know that there was an obstacle in a way. She just avoids it so cleanly for me that I didn't even know there was something in my way. And that's something that I love because, I mean, I'm pretty busy. I go from place to place. I don't really have time to bother about what's in my way and what's not in my way. So it's great yeah. that she does pretty much a lot of the work for me. Um, mm-hmm. However, it's um, good to jump in and say now that guide dogs are not a GPS. So I cannot tell her to <laughs> find the bus stop or find McDonald's or find Starbucks for me. She cannot do that. However, I, ca- I can tell her, you know, what are directions and she will follow the directions accordingly. And if there was obstacles in my way, she will avoid them for me. And she's also taught to find specific landmarks like... Um, finding the curb, so like the road crossings, um, mm-hmm. finding steps, finding the lift, finding escalators. She knows all these words. She's, she has vocabulary is pretty big, I would say. So, um, yeah, so I can, I can tell her to find these things and that's how she will find it for me. So if we're walking to a certain point, I know like, okay, we need to find the steps now. I'll say, oh, we're find the steps and she will find them for me. So, oh. yeah, so that's how, that's how we get around. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so she's basically helping you to navigate, but you yourself are the GPS because you need to know where you're, you're, you need to know the directions of like, okay, uh, turn left here, turn right here. You're just, you're exactly. just to navigate and she just kind of gets you there safely. Exactly. Exactly okay. that. And yes. any, are there any landmarks um, mm-hmm. maybe in your neighborhood or near your home mm-hmm. that Orinda mm-hmm. or like guide dogs are able to remember? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Are there any I would say, where yeah, guide say dogs, like, go home or like, or maybe that's too- guide dogs are incredibly yeah. smart. So, yeah. I, okay, for I'm not sure about other guide dogs, but I can tell you from Orinda's perspective is that she knows where I'm going based on the route that I'm taking. So, wow. this girl memorizes things so quickly, I can just bring her there once and she will memorize the route. She's so fast to learn. So it, it comes to the point where sometimes I even forget to give directions because I'm just walking along with her and she's just dragging me along. And like, she only stop when there's road crossing because she knows that she cannot cross the road unless I give her the command. So she'll just stop the road crossing and if I know it's clear now, I'll give her the okay command to let her to go ahead. But yeah, if she knows that, like, okay, this route, actually this is the route to go home. She'll go straight home. If say like this, oh, this seems like the route to go office. Like if I get off at the MRT station that takes me to my office, like, oh, this seems like the route, then she'll just take me to office. So she doesn't really know the word specifically like office. And um, mm. I try not to say the word home, especially close to like my bus stop because I wouldn't want to attract um, unnecessary attention mm-hmm. or have anybody follow me home in that sense. So right. um, yeah, right. it's more like a privacy thing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'll just say, okay, let's go. And somehow she knows. So Aww. yeah, she's, she's a very clever girl. I, I don't have to yeah. explain a lot to her. They have yeah. good memory of like all the directions and the routes. huh? Exactly. She is so smart. She's so smart to the point where she even knows the landmarks that she likes so, for example, there used to be like a little park near my area where she could yeah. go and run. But unfortunately, I think now it's undergoing construction. Mm-hmm. So, every time I try to take her on a walk and I try to take her from a direction that diverts away from the park, she knows and she will jam. She will be like, no, this is not the way. I'm going to show you the way. And she will take me, even if she's off harness, 
she knows and she will take me there and she will stand outside the gate and I'm like, Arinda, it's under construction. We can't go in. And she just stands there like, but I want to go in. <laughs> it's so, it's uh-huh. like trying to reason with a child that wants to go to the playground. I'm like, we can't go in. Oh, so <laughs> it, cute. it breaks my heart and it makes me feel really, really strange at the same time because I'm just there talking to a dog. And I don't think people understand how intelligent she is and that she actually understands the words that I'm saying. But yeah, to a passerby, it looks really weird. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. yeah. So, how does Orinda, your guide dog, um, mm-hmm. how does she know that she's working and she's when she's working and not working? Is it just the harness that oh, is? shucks. Yes, I should have brought the harness into my room. But yeah, anyway, yes, she she does wear a harness. So a harness is like it goes on the whole body, and it's very clear because there's a handle that goes from the back, and there's a giant sign that says "Do not distract um, guide dog at work." So um, that's where you know that, okay, she's working now, no interaction, um, no petting, basically just pretend she's not there, which is, I know it's very hard. (laughs) But she knows that as well, right? Yes, she knows. She knows. Yes, she she knows. She knows what to be doing. And so when you mentioned just now off harness, means that when you take the harness off, say if you bring her out for a walk, but without the harness, then she knows that she doesn't really need to be on duty. She can just be a dog or? Yes. She yeah. knows that she's not um, liable for my safety, let's say. <laughs> so okay. she's like, I am free. I'm just walking like a regular dog. And she, she knows Aww. she knows that. But I think the great thing about that is, is, I mean, like I said, depends from dog to dog. But for her, she actually still remembers her commands even though she's off harness. Some dogs only remember the commands when they're on harness because to them, off harness, like, it means they're totally off work. But for her, if sometimes if... I was crossing a road and I'm like, oh shoot, I can't find the path. I'm like, Arinda, can you find the path? And she will find the path for me. So she won't fully do exactly like what she's required to do on harness. But if say there were time to time I need her to help me find something like the path or a step, she can still do that for me. So yeah, she's very intelligent. (laughs) Amazing. And for these, during the training, right, where um, Arinda was learning how to use the harness and replying... um, uh, how do you say, reacting to the commands. Um, were, mm-hmm. were you a part of that? Like, were you already paired during that uh, training process? Like, no. while, while... So, yeah. Um, okay, so while her whole guide dog training was going on, they were definitely looking at my profile and saying that that was a very suitable match. But I was not there physically to watch her train. I was only matched with her and I only saw her once she was fully trained and when she came to Singapore. So she was actually doing all her training in Guide Dogs Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. And that's actually where we get most of our guide dogs is actually from Australia. We rarely have, I think we only have one guide dog so far um, that Mm -hmm. was trained in Singapore. But actually currently we have three guide dogs that are being trained in Singapore by our lovely guide dog mobility instructor, Christina. So she was my instructor and I was her very first client in Singapore while as she was um, declared a fully fledged um, guide dog mobility instructor or GDMI and I'm so proud to say that I'm her first because <laughs> that's a title that I'll always hold and she is so amazing with the dogs you can see that she has so much patience with them and um, yeah she's such she's such a great teacher overall like from for humans and for dogs like everything is so amazing but yes we currently have three in training right now and hopefully I don't know when they're going to be paired but I'm very very excited for them to be paired like I've met all three of the dogs already and they're all so cute oh. <laughs> yeah, it's all on the guide dog Singapore Instagram right that yes. and, and a black one and a white one and a, and a brown yes one. they're, they're so adorable and they all have such different personalities it's so mm-hmm. funny to watch and actually fun fact the black dog or Laurie is mm-hmm. Orinda's full brother. So <gasps> they have the exact same parents, however, from different litters. So they're not the same age, but okay. their parents are exactly the same. And mm-hmm. she, he, when I look at him, he looks exactly like Orinda, just black. And his head mm-hmm. shape, even I've touched his head, he feels exactly like Orinda, just a little larger. Oh, it's so, so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so talking about the pairing process right mm-hmm. like how yes. is it like 
have to apply as, as someone yeah. visually impaired to be able to be considered for the pairing and like or and then once once you get accepted um mm -hmm. how do they look at the pairing is it just like personality and temperament mm -hmm. that... okay so um pre, pre before you get uh, you know, when you apply for a guide dog, usually mm. what they do is that they look at your orientation and mobility skills. So that mm. basically means how are you able to independently travel from one place to another to via a familiar route. So they will assess that. And once that is done, they will also do um, the free sighted guide um, walking. So basically, it means that I will keep my cane, I will pass it on to someone else, and someone else will do sighted guide with me where I sit, um, you know, remember, um, I will be holding on to someone's elbow and the sighted person is in front of me. And basically, mm -hmm. this is to test my reaction skill. So they'll be walking me zigzag mm -hmm. and around and around to see how fast I react. Because when I'm with a guide dog, I don't have my cane, so I don't have as much tactile feedback as I would with a cane. So mm -hmm. it's basically to test my reaction skills to see, am I able to quickly respond with a guide dog? Because if my guide dog jam brakes, I have to jam brake with her because it means that there's a car coming or we're in danger. Or if, say, she's, we are walking really fast, and for example, myself, I'm a fast walker. So if she suddenly turns left, I have to be able to suddenly turn left with her. Or if she suddenly, mm -hmm. suddenly goes right, I have to suddenly go right. But so basically all these different reaction skills. On top of that, we also um, look at the house that we live in. We look at um, how many people are there in the house. Are there, is there elderly? Are there any children? Um, any more animals in the house? Um, what are the temperament of the animals in the house? If mm -hmm. there are animals in the house, um, also, um, what is your personal living li lifestyle like? So, um, are, you, like, are you a very busy person? Are you out every day? Or are you one that you know, likes to stay at home a lot and you only go out every once, every few days to the supermarket or just to visit mm -hmm. a friend? Um, so, they look at all these things also. Your walking speed, your height, your weight. All these actually ah. take, take into consideration. And your mm. walking stride. So, usually all these factors will take... Will they would look at um, your, your kind of profile and then from there, they'll match and say like, okay, so for example, myself, um, I don't have any animals at home. Um, mostly, um, I would say adults in this house. And um, I, um, I have a very busy lifestyle. So um, especially pre-COVID, I was out pretty much, oh my gosh, I think even 15 hours a day. So wow. I, was, I was a very busy person <laughs> yeah, pre-COVID. So um, yeah, basically training, work, going back to training and then coming back home. So there was a lot of traveling involved. And um, mm. yeah, I did a lot of my traveling very independently throughout the day. So, mm. um, so that's yeah. why they matched me with Orinda because Orinda, she is a very tiny girl. I'm not very big myself as well. Um, no. For reference, I am um, 161 on a good day. We usually 160. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, yeah, not, not a very big person. Um, yeah. Orinda, she is about 24 kilos on a good day. <laughs> Sometimes she's 25. <laughs> but yeah, she's still not very big for a Labrador. She's extremely small, but very fast walker. And yeah. little girl here loves the busy life. She does not like staying still for too long. She likes to keep it. She likes to keep it going. She likes to be out and about. She does not like to stay put in one place for too long. And that's basically the lifestyle that I have. So that's yeah. how they matched us accordingly. And yeah, so they, they it goes through a lot of processes before they actually match us together. Mm. That's so interesting. Yeah. I never would have known like all of these behind the mm -hmm. scenes, you know, the kind of like processes and all the mm -hmm. all the requirements needed. Because yes, I, like you mentioned, I I fail to remember sometimes that when you have a guide dog, it is really mm -hmm. like taking on a, a dog as if mm -hmm. it was a pet, but except even more. There's even oh, yeah. more involved, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with with Arinda and your bond with Arinda, is it um, true that like she never leaves your side? Like mm -hmm. you guys are like a pair now? <laughs> um, yes and no. I think we definitely like our time apart. Um, yeah. Actually, I would say in the house, I am not her favorite person. Somehow my father has taken on the favorite role. <laughs> and I think it's because my father does the cooking in the house. Um, the rest of us don't. And little girl here is a super foodie. So especially on Sunday, Sundays is cooking day because my dad will cook both lunch and dinner. And oh my goodness, she is in love. So she would just sit by the kitchen and just watch my dad cook 
all day. And oh. pretty much for the rest of the Sunday, I don't really see her, which to me is great because I get my time away from her. And, you know, mm. I mean, of course, I'll still be doing her toileting for her. I will be um, helping her with her, uh, giving her her meals and mm. uh, making sure she has water to drink. But apart from that, yeah, I don't really get to see her much on Sunday, which I think is great for the both of us. <laughs> because for the rest of the six days, we are pretty much tied to the hip, I would say. Like, we are, you know, pretty much together all the time. Um, yeah, and, and I think for good and for bad that we're always together. I mean, for bad, you know, you, you, really, you really just see this dog everywhere. And she's, very, <laughs> she's a very affectionate girl that loves cuddles and loves to be near you. And she not, likes to know that you know she's there. So, like, for example, I'll be using my phone and she sometimes even nudge my phone like, Hey, oh. by the way, I'm here. <laughs> So, so I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay, yes, I'm aware you're here. But mm. you know, it also acts as a great thing because in a way she acts as emotional support. Like somehow she's a very she has very great EQ on top of having very high yeah. IQ for a dog. She has incredible EQ mm. in the sense that um she's able to sense read and sense my emotions very well. So mm. if I was ever feeling like upset, she she would know of I'm feeling scared. Like somehow she does this thing where emotionally therapy dogs actually do, which is apply pressure onto the person. So oh. her instinct, if she feels, she knows that I'm feeling scared, she actually will put her head on my leg and she'll actually rest out and put quite a bit of pressure. Like I can feel that she's putting pressure on my leg. Oh, so awesome. it's really interesting. Of course, she was not taught this in guide dog school, but this is just something that she knows and she, she does, which it brings me so much comfort because I know that, hey, no matter what, like we are facing it together and she's there for me. So it's such a sweet thing to have, I would say. <laughs> One of the viewers actually mm -hmm. asked if we can see Orinda. Of course. The people course. who only joined later on. Sure. Okay, this everyone, is, this is Orinda. She's taking a nap. Oh. <laughs> Poor girl, he is taking a nap. Oh, so cute. <laughs> Orinda. <laughs> oh, so sweet. <laughs> She's very, very tired. I don't know why, but yeah, probably from chewing her bone all day. <laughs> no, it is true what you mentioned that like, mm -hmm dogs know who like is kind of in charge of the food because I used to have a dog as well and like mm. to just follow food like whoever had the food like I think oh, like yeah. he would only show his favorites based on like who's always around the best food <laughs> um, right yeah exactly Orinda is so smart to know that she knows that okay she knows that I give her food so of course like once in a while if I you know see her in the kitchen she'll say hi to me but yeah. she knows that my dad has the good goods. It's not her <laughs> usual, the ones that her she usual can't meals. Yeah, these, these are the ones where it smells amazing oh. and like every week is oh. different. So oh. yeah, she, she knows that yeah. my dad has, the, has better stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, they, they can smell. They can smell. Yes, um, yes, they can. What is, um, what is Orinda's retirement age as a guide dog? Mm-hmm. So, um, for guide dogs in Singapore, they are all required to retire by the age of 10. So, that means they have a good about 8 years for them to work. Mm -hmm. And um, after they retire, we have the option as the handlers to adopt them as a dog. So, they'll basically become like a pet. Um, of course, they won't have their guide dog rights anymore. So, we, they, we won't be able to bring them on public transport, bring them to malls anymore. But mm -hmm. we can have them as a pet. Um, yeah. We also have the option of adopting them out either to family members or to friends or if we can't find a home for them ourselves, we can return them back to Guide Dog Singapore and that's where um, Guide Dog Singapore will find a volunteer that will be able to take care of them until they pass on. So there's so the, many different options for us. Mm, mm. So the first two mm. years, like we mentioned before, mm. is for training, right? For yes. a guide dog. And then eight years of service and yes. then after that, it's retirement. Oh. Yes. And do you exactly. have plans for Orinda? Are you going to keep her? My ideal, ideal Rosie plan is, of course, that I keep her because mm. I, you know, you form such a bond with the dog uh. that you don't really want to let them go. <laughs> oh. So I mean, it's very difficult. But I also have to think about if I want to get a guide dog immediately after she retires, and in that case, that's going to be hard, hard for me because. 
Arinda is the sort of dog that she does not like attention. She does not like to share. So um, she's much happier being an only child or only dog <laughs> in that sense. So if I were to bring another dog into an equation, and not only that, but a dog that's taking over her role, it's going to be very difficult for her to see and for her to watch. So um, I think this is an answer I only can give like once you know, the time has come for me to um, retire her and decide what to do. Um, but as of now, the plan is to keep her, but um, no guaranteed promises as yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I wish you all the best. I hope that it works out yeah. for both of you either way. Same. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's I don't want to think about it now. I don't want to think nah, about I it. <laughs> it's so sad. Not. Um, these are a few, like, I've been asking questions that are also questions from my followers that have sure. asked Q&A, but I have sure. a few other questions about um, you and Orinda. So one of them is also, um, what are some of Orinda's funniest and quirkiest traits as a dog? Oh my goodness. Oh, she loves attention. <laughs> so she Only likes it to the point... I tell you, she's strange. She's so strange. So she likes, she likes it when she, she likes to play with toys, but she likes to play it by herself, but while you watch her. So for example, like she will have a toy and she'll be squeaking it and like playing with it and chewing on it and gnawing on it. But the whole time she's playing with it, I have to watch her like exactly like how I'm looking at my phone, just staring, full on staring. If oh. I turn and do something else, she thinks like, oh, I'm not allowed to play with my toy anymore. And she just stops. Now I'm like, you, you don't have to stop. You can keep playing. So she's, yeah, I would say that's one of the strangest things yeah. that she does. That she just likes me to watch her do her own thing. Which is, I don't know many dogs that do that. She, she yeah. has a like, only child syndrome, I think. Extremely only child syndrome, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I think I can share like a really funny story that she did only once ever, but I loved it so much. So, um... <laughs> There was one time I actually finished, just finished toileting her and we were going up the staircase and we were walking up the stairs and I don't know why but that, I remember that day I was having a particularly hard day and I was feeling like rather down and sad for some reason. I can't even remember why. Mm -hmm. So we we're walking up this rather long flight of stairs and she just suddenly stops and because I was walking like slightly behind her and she just turns around and just smiles at me and I'm like, what? And she just turns 180 and just walks up the rest of the flower stairs backwards. And I was like, what are you doing? Oh my god. Super it was dumb. so cute. It was just more like a, watch this. And then just starts like walking backwards up the stairs. I just lost my mind. I was laughing oh, so oh. hard when I saw that. It was so hilarious. And she, the way she just smiled and just strut her way like up the stairs backwards. It was hilarious i wish i had it on video but it only happened once ever so oh. i think that's just a memory between the two of us yeah so <laughs> it's so cute it was so adorable yeah <laughs> dogs oh my god they're so funny they're so cute. yeah they are <laughs> and also um what do you think arinda means to you besides being your guide like do you think that you could you would consider her your best friend she's so many things she's like a child she's like a best friend she's a companion she's a guide she's an angel sent from god like there's so many things that she is and um really i i really don't know like she's just i would say she's like an extension of myself basically mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she reads off my emotions so much mm -hmm. that a lot of myself is reflected onto her as well. Mm -hmm. And because we do our day-to-day -day activities together so often that in a way, she knows what I do. She knows my schedule. So, yeah, you know, it, it feels like, it feels very empty if I don't have her by my side. And sometimes I do like go out like for a short while without her, like with a cane. And when I do, I, to me, it feels so strange not having her there because I'm like, huh, like, a bit of me is missing. <laughs> like, it, I don't feel whole. Like, something feels mm. strange. Mm. Yeah, so... And do you it's, think... Yeah, it's... Yeah, and do you think after you've, you know, had Orinda in your life and you've gotten used to having a guide dog, do you mm. think you'd ever... You, do you think you could go back to not having a guide dog and just, you know, having your cane? 
I think the question is, can I go to another guide dog? And the question is so quickly. Because they were saying, I heard from many, many guide dog users that the first transition is the worst because all you've ever known is that one guide dog. So, yeah. for example, to me, guide dog means Orinda. It doesn't mean guide dog is any dog that can guide. To me, a guide dog is Orinda. So, mm. I know that and I'm very aware that I'll likely need to grieve for a while, especially after she retires and after she passes. I'm very prepared to grieve because she's so much, you know, she's so, we're so intertwined. And like, even going out for a short while without her is, is, I wouldn't say painful, but I can feel that something is missing. So Mm. let alone like, having to not have her with me forever, like once, you know, once she's, gone and once she passes like that is going to be something that is going to be very difficult for me and I see foresee myself taking a while to grieve before getting the next guide dog so um yeah <laughs> I really I really don't know what's going to happen in the future like I really try not to think about I like every day to me is like I'm going to make today the best day for her like, I'm just trying to like make the best out of it because um, yeah, the sad thing about guide dogs is that, you know, you can't have them for the rest of the, your life. You know, they, they will pass on much earlier than you do and you'll have multiple guide dogs in your entire life if you choose to be a permanent guide dog user. So, mm. um, yeah, it's just something that we have to accept and get used to if we want to um, bring in a guide dog into our lives. Yeah. And like I mentioned previously, that we forget that guide dogs are also like a part of the family. There is mm-hmm. really to you know uh, a a pet who also is your like companion during the day like for work and stuff mm-hmm. so oh man losing a pet is never easy i know from experience so yes that's not, only positive things long yes. life <laughs> yes over, a lot of positive energy i don't um, know if you heard or really just went <sighs> oh really <laughs> she's oh, my snoring God. talking oh <laughs> wait, wait, wait. let me let me see if you can hear her Uh, she stopped. Oh my okay. god, I kind of heard it. I kind of heard it. It was like... You heard it? Soft. Is she snoring? She's sleeping. Yeah, she's snoring. Oh, she's full on snoring right now. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Oh. And um, mm. I think we're almost at the end of our IG live now. Whoa, um, that's fast. <laughs> 9 p.m. So it was a, a one hour almost. Um, wow. Any uh, final words you'd like to say? Maybe like hopes that you have for the future or mm-hmm. um you know in an ideal world you know what kind of how would guide dogs singapore or like the visual impaired community be like in singapore like what what do, what do you what are your feelings i, I feel don't know that what mm, i think my ideal world would be a fully accessible singapore to have to be in a place where i never have to worry about accessibility i never have to worry about um, whether I'm going to be denied entry or if anyone's going to make nasty comments about me and Orinda because it does happen, I wouldn't say very frequently, but somewhat frequently. Sometimes people are not very understanding and um, they start making a fuss. And in, I feel that you know we are blessed to be in a country that is so small. So word passes on very quickly. So you know I feel like the more people we get involved in the guide dog movement and the visually impaired community, the more you know, more changes that we can make and more quickly. And like I said, we are being, us being such a small country, we can make the, the changes. It is very possible and it is, we are in very high potential to be a very accessible country through education and not only just education from big platforms such as your platform or even the Guide Dog Singapore platform, but just word of mouth is, makes such a big difference as well. Just having someone to tell you and you telling your friends about it makes such a big difference so i think it's something that we need to be a lot more vocal about and talk more about to move towards a place where we can be a fully accessible country and that's where i'm gonna leave it (laughs) yeah that was a great summary i mean i completely agree i i hope that everyone you know who's tuned in to our ig live everyone who's watching and listening you know share share about um, what you learned today, you know, if you if you happen to see a guide dog or someone uh, who's visually impaired with a cane, hopefully, you know, you have more tools to, that you've learned today that you can help or, you know, even be more accepting, um, more kind. I feel like the world needs more of that now more than yes. ever. You know, I hope <laughs> we that do. 
yeah, and I hope that for um, in Singapore, especially, I hope that, you know, more um, people in whether it's in like the, the private transport sector, right, with cabs, with grabs, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, and, and also in the restaurant F&B, you know, yes. I, hope for you, I hope for you in the yeah. coming years that you will find people are getting more accepting and hopefully people are getting more educated about this topic. Mm -hmm. So yes. everyone said the word. Yeah, yo, you know. Yes. <laughs> so much. Thank you so much, Sophie, for thank you this hour with me and sharing all these insights. I learned so much. I hope thank everyone, you. everyone who tuned in, also learns. I, even if they took away one thing, you know, I would be so happy. So I really hope so. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for being yeah. here. <laughs> and thank you, Guide Dog yeah. Singapore, as well for letting this happen. And thank you, everyone, for joining our late night thoughts. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Support, support. Thank, Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow you on Instagram yes. and I'll keep up to date with you and Orinda. Yay. Great. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll see you. <laughs> see you around. Bye. Bye.